OK, uh, thanks for the invitation uh, and the opportunity to speak. Uh, this will uh, be similar to some of the things you've heard already, and the, the previous speakers have, have already kind of given you the, the, the introduction for, for, the, for this talk, uh, which is the notion that now with the ability to sequence many cancer uh, genomes, can we identify the mutations that are causing cancer and distinguishing them, distinguish them from those that are, that are merely passengers? Now, ultimately, that's a biological distinction, and one has to go do an experiment to, to figure out which are the functional mutations and which are the random passengers. But we might be able to get uh, information about how to prioritize these experiments by finding uh, uh, genes that are uh, mutated more than we expect by chance. And so this has been one of the uh, motivations for uh, large projects like the Cancer Genome Atlas and the International Cancer Genome Consortium. And when we first got involved in, in one of these projects, they, they were at the time using a, a method to prioritize which genes are mutated more than, than expected by chance. And now there are many such methods. And it's not uh, uh, such an easy thing to, to actually develop such methods. But no matter how you try to prioritize one gene at a time, you're sort of left facing a, a, a picture like this, which is as you rank genes by their significance, you tend to get a relatively small number of genes, which you can say are, are significantly mutated mutated with the, some comfortable level of statistical significance, followed by this long tail of rarely mutated genes. And we know that not all the important cancer genes are, are in this leading edge and that there are many important cancer genes and mutations in, in this long tail. So how can we uh, uh, do better and, and, and dig into this? And, and more importantly, how, how, what's the explanation for this, for this picture? Why, why do we sort of imagine that there would be uh, uh, such a phenomenon? And of course, at this meeting, uh, it's not a surprise. And if you talk to many biologists, they give you a one-word explanation for this picture picture, which was the explanation we heard on the teleconference with that, which was that this is all just pathways. So it's pathways. So somehow magically pathways sort of explain this picture. And of course, you know, to some extent they, they, they do. And, and, and we know that genes don't work on their own. They work together in, 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 in pathways and networks. And so somehow we should be explaining this data using, using pathways. If you look at many cancer sequencing papers, and particularly those, say, from the, the Cancer Genome Atlas, you'll see these beautiful pictures that show you these mutations clustering on, on pathways. But when we read the first of these papers, which is actually not shown here, it's the glioblastoma paper, we thought, well, this is a really beautiful picture. It's a great illustration of the data on top of the known pathways that, that we know about. But you know, what's, what's the p-value of this picture? There is none. There was none that was computed. Is this the most important grouping of mutations that, that are, are found in the data? Perhaps there's some other pathway we should have been uh, exploring. So if we sort of do a thought experiment and we think that um, cancer is driven by mutations in pathways, then with enough data, shouldn't we be able to discover the pathways? Shouldn't they somehow reveal themselves? We could have discovered the pathways by one gene at a time, sort of you know, figuring out that it's a cancer gene. But could, could we do better? Uh, of course, we can test known pathways, and we've heard about, about this extensively, and there are great tools for doing this, but you know, that won't tell you anything new, and it, it won't somehow show you somehow the picture that, that, that's being uh, illustrated here, where there's, you know, there's interactions, there's topology of these networks. It's not just a, a gene set. So what could we do? Uh, and, and, and of course, this has already sort of been previewed. You know, rather than testing known pathways, could we re somehow reduce our prior knowledge and find these combinations? Of course, as we do so, the number of combinations that we need to explore explore grows exponentially, so we can't go and test all combinations. But there must be something in between. And what could be in between? Well, one might be an interaction network, as we've already sort of heard, and I'll continue that theme. But uh, we might also be able to do other things, which uh, you also have sort of been previewed, and I, I won't really have uh, that much time to, to discuss, where we can use signals of uh, mutual exclusivity or anti-correlation between mutations. So the setup uh, for the, the, the first approach here is we're given mutation data. Here it might be single nucleotide mutations in genes. We're given copy number aberrations. We've given mutation data of various types. We're given some prior knowledge of interactions. This could be uh, high throughput data. It could be uh, literature curated interactions. Choose your favorite representation of, of the human interaction network. And then how can you combine these things? How can you let the data lead you to the subnetworks that are mutated more than expected by chance? So when we started working on this uh, a few years ago, there were you know, various methods for finding uh, modules and graphs, but there wasn't really a method that addressed this problem directly. Um, of course, you need to account for the topology, the small world, power law, uh, shortest, you know, 
shortest paths between nodes, et cetera. Uh, you need to also, though, somehow account for uh, uh, the, the score on the gene, somehow the frequency with which it's mutated, and the topology of the network. And you'd like to do these things simultaneously. You don't want to sort of threshold your genes and then only use the, the topological properties of the network. And then there's somehow a, a statistical concern here, because you need to go and, and, and pull out these significantly mutated networks. So in order to address these challenges, we developed this method, which, which was called uh, uh, HotNet. And, and you sort of heard, heard about this a little bit. Uh, in brief, there, there's sort of a, the idea that you think of mutations as sources of heat on the graph. You allow that heat to diffuse for some length of time. That will sort of smooth out the scores over the network. And then you break the network by removing cold edges and thereby find these hot subnetworks. And there's a statistical test that, that, that one employs. So I'm going to dig into the, the, the details of this uh, a, a little bit after you know, showing you some results. So it's been applied to several um, TCGA studies. Uh, over the years. And uh, several years ago, we started working on this pan cancer project, which was uh, over 3,000 samples, an order of magnitude more samples than we'd ever analyzed in any of these uh, published studies where we'd gotten what we thought were nice results. And, and, and we thought, well, this is great. This is a big data set. We've got, we've got great data. We've got the data. We've got the tool. We've got the talent. And, and we're going to you know, just do this. And I reportedly perhaps even said that this will be the easiest nature paper ever. I don't recall saying that, but I'm, I'm told that perhaps I did say this. Uh, <laughs> and here's what the data look like, just to sort of show you 12 cancer types. Here's the number of samples. They're sort of color coded in this nice way. Here's the sort of long tail phenomenon shown sort of in two dimensions, where we're indicating the number of samples with a mutation in a, in, in a, in a single nucleotide mutation in a gene, a number of samples with a copy number aberration in the gene. For those of you that work at cancer data, you'll recognize these well-known outliers, sort of a who's who of cancer genes, P53, uh, MIX, CCND1, EGFR, et cetera. And here's this sort of long tail shown in two dimensions. And we know there's lots of great cancer genes in here. They're just too rare to be sort of identified on their own, or many of them are. So let's run HotNet on this data. And we did that, and the results were not so great. Um, and we thought maybe this is a problem of the parameters, and we tweaked the parameters. And what we could not get rid of were these artifacts of highly mutated genes like P53 uh, that were sort of sending all their heat to their neighbors. And this was you know, the phenomenon that was always in the algorithm, but somehow we never noticed it. Because like, when we increased the number of samples by an order of magnitude, the dynamic range from the most mutated to the least mutated gene also increased. And so you know, now we have this problem where the hottest genes were much hotter than the coldest genes. The other way of thinking about this is the, rare, the long tail, these rare genes, there's a lot more of them. Okay, so was, this was always a problem. We hadn't noticed it. Somehow the big data set didn't help us. It pointed out sort of an issue with, with the algorithm. So, so Fabian Vendeen, who you heard from earlier, right, so he's not, oh, there he is. All right, yes. Now Professor Vendeen, uh, working with uh, Max Leistrus and one of my PhD students, uh, decided uh, that, that we needed to address this. Now, when I talk to a, a biology audience, usually I just give the, the solution, right? But I thought maybe this was the audience that would tolerate, perhaps even appreciate, some equations, although it's right before lunch. So looking around, I'm not sure that I made the right choice here. Uh, yes. Uh oh. Yes. Are these number of SMBs in any sample? Yeah. This is this is across all samples. Yeah. So this three. Yes. Yeah. This is pan cancer analysis. Three thousand samples. We forget about which type they are. So P53 is in a little under half the samples. Uh, we'll come back to all that. Let's do our mathematical interlude before it's too close to lunch. Um, OK, so uh, here we are. So what's really going on with the algorithm? So what's, what's, what's hot, hot net? Well, hot net has to somehow use heat. Heat is, is, is given by the heat equation. Uh, and, and so the heat equation, you might remember uh, from maybe not, if you ever took uh, uh, differential equations, uh, there's, there's the equation that describes how heat flows in, in, in space. You can do the same thing on a graph. And you can describe how heat flows on a graph. And the equation is that the rate of change of heat is, is just proportional to the difference in heat along adjacent vertices. So you can just write all this down. You can write down this differential equation in terms of just the adjacency matrix of the graph. Actually, it just ends up being written down in terms of what's called the Laplacian matrix of the graph. And you can solve it, and the solution is just given by this matrix exponential. So now I can describe the heat at time t on any vertex just by multiplying this matrix, which is given just by the Laplacian of the graph, times the initial heat. It's sometimes called the, the heat kernel. So what that means now is that we can 
uh, sort of propagate heat, and, and this is sort of related to think, algorithms you may have heard about called network propagation, by taking some initial distribution of scores. Here's these might be our gene scores, and you multiply them by this heat kernel, and you get the heat on the vertices after this time t. Uh, and then you can somehow interpret these, these scores. So this is what's sometimes called network propagation. Uh, similarly, you might instead think of you know, nodes that you might indicate are perhaps cancer genes, and then mark those as with a heat of 1 and other genes with a heat of 0, somehow these seed vertices, and then multiply by that vector, and you get a ranking of vertices relative to the seed nodes. Some of you may have seen this, and this is roughly called uh, network prioritization. Okay? Now, a few of you might be thinking, well, what am I going to have for lunch? But some of you might be thinking, Ben, you know, I've read about network prioritization and network propagation, but it's not heat. They use a random walk. It's supposed to be a random walk. That's what you're supposed to do. Well, in fact, it's the same thing most of the time, as some of you know. And in this case, in fact, this heat kernel or this heat equation is exactly the same equation as you get if you did a lazy random walk on the graph, meaning at every time step with probability alpha, I pick one of the neighbors, and with the remaining probability, I stay where I am. And it gives me the exact same equation. So the probability that I end up at various nodes at time t is just given by this initial distribution times this heat kernel. And this is a, one example of a beautiful connection between random walks and diffusion processes, which is true in Euclidean space, but also true on graphs. This is the continuous time version. Most computer scientists don't do the continuous time version because graphs are discrete, and we're used to discrete things, so we do the discrete time version. But, but the idea is the same, and you get a slightly different equation like this. Yeah? So in all these methods, there is a, a notion of conservation of heat. So yes. Like, more the degree, you are giving each, each node a little bit less. So. Mm -hmm. Yes. In some situations, it may be. But in other situations, there's nobody stopping that node to be influencing all the nodes with the same influence, you know? Yeah, so what this is doing is, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's essentially ends up downweighting high degree nodes to some extent. Is that, is that the right thing? Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's a good question. It's one I kind of hope we get into in the discussion this afternoon. So this is kind of part of the, part of the reason I'm bringing all these things up. Uh, okay, so um, this is it. This is the, the lazy uh, random walk. But in fact, some of you are thinking, this is not the lazy random walk. Is anyone thinking this? <laughs> no one's thinking this. You should be thinking this, because if you look at most literature, the lazy random walk is actually this one, where you stay at a node with the same probability. So your laziness is equal at every node, and then you transition to other nodes with, with different uh, probabilities. So see the difference? We call this kind of the locally lazy random walk, and this one kind of the global lazy random walk. You're lazy equally with no matter where you are. They're both in the literature called the lazy random walk, so it's actually somewhat annoying. Um, and, and even more than that, the, the equation, the, the matrix you get here is slightly different. Okay? Uh, yeah, it doesn't look too much different, but it's slightly different. But actually, this one is, is not a symmetric matrix, whereas this one was. Right? And amazingly, if you look at some of the papers, about half the time, I don't know if it's half, they actually transpose this equation. And it could be a typo. We don't know. But you know, maybe it's corrected in their code. Maybe it's a typo in the paper and correct in the code. Maybe it's a typo in the code and correct in the paper. No one ever knows. So it's sort of a frustrating thing. Um, uh, but it's also the lazy random walk, right? So that's good. But then a very, very small number of you are thinking, uh, well, this is not network prioritization, because we don't use the random walk. You're supposed to use the random walk with restart, which is a slightly different random walk, where you transition to each node with some probability, but then with probability 1 minus beta, you just jump or teleport to any other node in the graph. And that is given by this preference vector where you sort of teleport. So the equation changes here slightly. You get a different matrix. It's called a page rank matrix because if you make this vector the uniform vector, then the distribution you get is what's called the page rank vector of the graph, which is you know multi billion dollars for Google. This is how web pages are ranked, right? It's all sort of related, really, right? You're just sort of changing things ever so slightly. Right. Okay. So that was our interlude. 
was our interlude. Now let's get back to HotNet2. The, the equations are still here, though, because now I want to sort of put this in context. So the original HotNet, we used the heat equation. Actually, the original thing that wasn't called HotNet, we didn't use the heat equation, but that's another story. Uh, but in the one that was called HotNet, we used the heat equation. Um, and then here's the sort of one sort of, uh, sort of slight thing. What we end up doing is ranking nodes one at a time relative to all the other nodes. So each column of this is one of these network propagation or prioritization things. But you do this once for every node, okay? so that you're multiplying by these vectors. So the end result is not a single distribution over vertices, but what can be interpreted as a similarity matrix. In fact, it has a nice physical interpretation. The heat on a vertex uh, at time t given the initial heat on the other vertex j at time 0. So each entry is like that. So it's a similarity matrix. So now you could just start to cluster the nodes. But of course, you can't quite do this because this matrix is not symmetric. And everyone knows that sim similarity matrices have to be symmetric. Reviewers told us this many times. Uh, <laughs> so we symmetrize it. And then now we have a symmetric similarity matrix. And then we can cluster. Choose your favorite clustering algorithm. We weren't so smart, so we just did the obvious thing. You just sort of interpret these as weights of a graph, if you will, complete weighted graph. This is the influence graph that, that Fabio mentioned. Uh, threshold, and then find connected components in the resulting threshold of thing. Simplest clustering algorithm ever. Okay, that's hot now. That's, that's really what's going on. In some ways, we didn't even really think, we didn't think about it this way you know, when, we, when we first did it. Uh, we thought about it a slightly different way, which was also right. But, uh, and then this is where we sort of get into trouble. Because the symmetrization, the way we did it, allowed for these types of artifacts. So what's the solution? Well, the solution we came up with is maybe we shouldn't symmetrize this thing. Let's, uh, let's keep it asymmetric. And this is where we had to fight with some reviewers. And you know, let's try to cluster in asymmetric matrices, which is actually a fairly underdeveloped field. There's some work there. And again, since we weren't you know, wanting to develop a new clustering algorithm, we just now interpret this as the weights of a now directed graph, complete directed graph. And we threshold. And then now, because the graph's directed, we compute strongly connected components. Okay? So this is the new algorithm, uh, which, which we called HotNet2, or the Spanish translation, HotNet2, for diffusion-oriented subnetworks, conveying the idea that we're keeping track of the source of the heat. Okay? Sort of what's really going on with this asymmetry. So there it is. Wow, we got through that mathematical interlude pretty fast. Uh, and then the last step of the algorithm, so we do all this, and this is the same for 1 and 2. We do the diffusion, we do this extract, and then we have to do the statistical test. Okay, and We've already sort of had some conversations about statistical tests, and we'll probably have more. One point I wanted to make about the statistical test is that here, the statistical test is fairly tricky because we're trying to identify these subnetworks. And a priori, there's many subnetworks that we're examining when we're doing the algorithm. There's lots. You know, so there's a big, huge multiple hypothesis correction problem we would have to do. And we need some way to kind of develop a test where we can get reasonable FDRs. So the solution was to you know, look at the output of the algorithm. And the statistic we will use is the number of subnetworks of a given minimum size, x sub s. Now, the number of possible hypotheses, x sub s, is bounded by the number of genes in the network. So there aren't, there aren't so many. So this, now we can do a multiple hypothesis correction on this statistic. In doing so, however, we lose one thing. And I'm not going to get into the whole FDR correction. But I just want to say that by doing uh, uh, the statistic here, what we're able to do is produce a list of subnetworks with a false discovery rate on that list. So we would say, here's a list of. 10 subnetworks output by the algorithm, with the FDR of that list being 0.1, suggesting that conservatively one of those 10 is wrong, a false discovery. But we can't tell you which one. You have to lose something because it's a, there's too many hypotheses. And that's sort of where the loss happens. OK, so now back to the details in the last five minutes here. We'll make it on time for lunch, almost, if you don't have many questions. Um, so we benchmark. Benchmarking's hard, right? I mean, I can show you great simulations where we can 
just do better than anything ever produced. Uh, that's not very informative. So you want to try to make it as realistic as you can. And so here we try to benchmark on the problem we're interested in, which is finding new cancer genes. But we don't know all the cancer genes. So we end up making a list of cancer genes using what's called the, the 2020 rule of Vogelstein, which is that they you know, have either clustered mutations or they have mostly inactivating mutations. And if you create a list like this, and then you look at how HotNet2 is doing compared to, HotNet, compared to pathway-based methods, yeah, we, we do pretty well. I mean, we're sort of dominating performance. And, you know, it's, it's going in the right direction, so that's good. We have other stuff, too, I could show you. But let me show you the results, and then I'll answer all the questions about all the things we did, all the choices we made here. So here's the, the pan-cancer analysis that we ended up with. We ended up running on three different interaction networks. We found this was valuable because no single interaction network was really fully representative of, of the biology. We thought we could run the algorithm on separate ones and then form a consensus of the results rather than trying to build the ultimate human interaction network, which is itself a hard problem. The end result is that we find these 16 consensus subnetworks and then these linkers between them. Here's the pretty picture that ended up, unfortunately, not in nature. So I was wrong, uh, but didn't end up here. And uh, this nice circle diagram showing you each of the subnetworks. So you can't really read any of this, but they're sort of arranged in the circle according to the cancer types that are enriched. They contain frequently mutated genes, well-known cancer genes, so that's good, but also rarely mutated ones, so I can sort of zoom in on one. Here's P53 signaling. Again, P53 was that super hot node, which caused a bunch of problems before, but now we've got a little bit on, more under control. It's still a big network, but many of the genes that we pull in are real cancer genes, as well as some rarely mutated genes, like this CHD8, which is a chromatin remodeling gene, and turns out more, with more recent work seems to be a, a real cancer gene, but I won't go into that now. We get some other stuff that was more recently characterized. If we had done the analysis five years ago, we'd be famous because we'd discover a whole new bunch of new protein complexes involved in cancer, but they've all been recently discovered in the past five years. So we're not so famous. Uh, and, and more stuff like this. And, and I'll just show you one or two of these to give you the picture. So here's the cohesin complex. And what you can see, this is the genes, sorry, genes across samples. And then this color-coded thing, which is kind of washed out, what you're seeing is how it's mutated very rarely across all different cancer types and in different components of the complex. So the algorithm is actually picking up on the signal and discovering cohesin because of both its interactions and its mutation frequency. Uh, as a couple of years ago, cohesin not widely regarded for its role in cancer, more recently appreciated as uh, frequently mutated in cancer. Here, about 7% of samples. Digging further down, here's a sister complex of cohesin called condensin, named for its role in sister chromatin condensation. Actually, it was mentioned in the regulatory genomics workshop earlier for its role in chromatin structure. Uh, and we're finding, again, very rare mutations in condensin that together uh, add up, and, see, and we see condensin mutated in about 4% of the samples. So you can go further with this, and we've been doing work where, because we have uh, strongly connected components, we can compute a hierarchy of connected components. This is sort of interesting because we can kind of dig into the relative contributions of different genes to different complexes in terms of their mutations in cancer and get relationships between the complexes. So for example, we see you know, sort of well-known well and related complexes kind of merging in together in, in the network. This is driven not just by their topology in the network, but also by their mutation frequencies. And then things that are a little further further afield, core binding proteins, et cetera. Even within a complex, we can kind of see a bunch of the well-known cancer genes and notch signaling sort of merging in together first, some of the stuff that's a little more speculative and perhaps wrong kind of merging in later. So it gives us a way to kind of look at the, the results, and we're trying to kind of put together this hierarchical approach into a better statistical test. We're also looking at bigger data sets. Uh, now the uh, ICGC has 2,800 whole whole genome, so the number of samples isn't bigger, but we're now analyzing the whole genome and non-coding mutations, and uh, this, this allows us to do different things, and um, this time we hope the algorithm will just run, and we'll write the paper. We'll see. Uh, yeah, we'll see. Um, and so here, here's the summary of the HotNet2 uh, stuff. It, it pulls out subnetworks from both topology and, and the vertex scores. The pathways and complexes you get out are frequently, contain frequently mutated genes, but also rarely mutated genes. And it's important that you have both the vertex score and the topology analyzed simultaneously. Because if you were to threshold the score and then look only at topology, you'd probably miss a lot of the rare stuff. And the algorithm's sort of general. And just maybe one minute, because actually I'm under time. Huh? Uh, in, 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 in one minute, I'll just say, you know, going further in this direction, you've already kind of heard about this. We, we you know, after doing HotNet, we, we said, that's great, problem solved, let's go do something else. 
And so we said, let's get rid of the network and uh, go try to find combinations of mutations with no prior information. You can't do that, so you need to do something. And the something is you look for these correlations between mutations, or in fact, you look at anti-correlation because it had been observed that mutations within a pathway, you rarely have more than one mutation in a pathway uh, in an individual patient. You could explain this through a sort of evolutionary argument that a second mutation in the pathway doesn't give the cells uh, much of a, a selective advantage. You could explain this observation using just a counting argument, which is that there are relatively few driver mutations distributed over multiple different biological processes. So if you just run the numbers, you get approximately one mutation per pathway per patient. So you sort of see this phenomenon of in this pathway, this is old data, that there's uh, samples have rarely have more than one mutation in, in a member of this pathway. So turn this idea around, just take your mutation data, and then just go try to find these signals of sets of mutations or mutated genes that are mutually exclusive or approximately exclusive. And we sort of introduced this idea with the Dendrix algorithm and have since iterated on it, uh, multi-Dendrix, along with uh, Rodez Sharon, uh, Comet, the most recent version, and Max Leisterson gave a talk on this at the uh, uh, cancer workshop in February. So you can go view the recorded stream of that and see that work. Just one example of this, just analyzing, say, P53 signaling data in glioblastoma from about 200 samples. Here's one of the sets you kind of pull out of, of three genes mutated with copy number aberrations or mutations, sort of fairly exclusive. And in fact, it's three interactions from the P53 signaling pathway. So you're discovering the interacting genes solely from these anti-correlations or mutual exclusivity between the mutations. So no prior information, discovering the pathways, and we're pushing further on that. Uh, and with that, I'll end and just acknowledge the folks that did it. Of course, uh, uh, Fabio Vendin, who's been mentioned a few times already, Max Leiserson, uh, several other members of, of, of uh, my group, uh, some of the early work collaborations with, with Ellie Ufall at Brown, uh, and then a lot of the pan cancer analysis uh, collaborations with uh, uh, several, m multiple people at other, other institutions. And, the funding and the software is, is all sort of available on the web page. So with that, I'll end. Happy to take questions, or we can go to lunch. <laughs>
It, it seems like a logical continuation to go for the whole genome and HotNet2, but what is the relationship between non-coding variants and the protein injection? Yes, there's the, there's the $1,000 question. Um, so in the first pass, what we're planning to do is use methods that will take the non-coding mutations and link them to a gene, right? So we try to match the promoters or enhancers. What is the link? The What's that? On genome or what no, no, I mean using um, encode data, using known chip seek peaks, trying to match which enhancers are affecting which which proteins. This yeah. this project, this yeah. So this this um, it's a big project. This ICGC is doing what's called the PCOG project. So there's dozens of groups, and mu multiple of the groups are exactly trying to you know interpret the non-coding genome in various ways. And a lot of that has to do with trying to find which non-coding elements they can sort of attach to different genes, but. We're hoping in the first pass to try to just sort of use those annotations, but I, I don't have anything to tell you that that's going to work yet. Yeah, in the hierarchy of uh, some networks, what, what's the measure that you're using for uh, CLR? Ah, right, yeah. So that, that comes down to uh, th this thresholding. So we started with this uh, similarity matrix, which we is a complete weighted graph, and then we just thresholded it and found strongly connected components. The point is, you don't have to thresh. You could just compute the strongly connected components over all choices of threshold. And in fact, you can do this even efficiently. This is a there's a version of Tarjan's algorithm that that actually did a hierarchy of strongly connected components. So that's that's what's happening. It's the same similarity matrix. It's just you're you're varying it, and that similarity matrix came from the heat times the mutation at scores. But you're finding the subnetworks as you go along or separating before the process? Uh, as you go along. So, I mean, the, pro the, process, the process is, I mean, the process is just linear algebra, right? You just compute that similarity matrix, and then you need to cluster that similarity matrix. And all this is is essentially just a hierarchical clustering of that similarity matrix. But where, where in, in this process do you find this? The with the large of I mean, a, a, along along the whole way, right? So that what we're what's sort of being shown here, and this is actually sort of real real data. It's like these are the individual genes. You know, this this is the similarity at which they would merge together in a strongly connected component. So this is this parameter delta. Is this you know, essentially the similarity as you go across in similarity? When are these genes genes merging together into a strongly connected component? Which could be. Could be pretty large, and in fact, you know, I'm showing you kind of the, the, you know, we're zooming in on this, and I'm showing you this version in a stylized form because if you actually look at the whole uh, hierarchy, there's a lot of other stuff going on here. So I'm not showing you every single gene or every single pathway. Yeah, it is large and it gets messy. Still, I don't understand. So would you make this hierarchy structure? Um, do you characterize each subnet and use all different versions, or you go back to all members of subnet and use? Still, I mean, every time you make this hierarchy, you consider all members of the system. Uh, well, there's only one. There's only one hierarchy, uh, and it's constructed from a single similarity matrix. So, I mean, think of just gene expression data and doing hierarchical clustering, right? There's a single similarity matrix between genes, and then I can just hierarchically cluster that. Here, I guess it's sort of a you know, agglomerative clustering just by kind of varying this threshold of when I group things together. So that's all, that, that's, all that's going on here, really. It's just done with strongly connected components, but, uh, you know, it's essentially thresholding. So think of it another way. Let me take a, you know, this, this complete weighted graph. That's our similarity matrix, different right? Different hierarchy. You said different threshold is applied? There's only one hierarchy. It says you vary the threshold. The, the components will start to merge together. So I take this complete weighted graph, if I use the threshold of cutting as the highest entry in that matrix, then every node is on its own, because there's no edge of that. As I start to lower that threshold, so now I say, give me all edges with you know, similarity above 1,000, whatever. Then I'll get you know, a few edges there, and they'll form components. Now give me everything with 999, 998, 997. More edges will start forming in this graph, forming more strongly connected components. And as you vary that threshold, they'll just keep growing and growing and growing. And eventually, everything merges together, and you get the whole graph. Yeah. So, so it's actually very interesting. So uh, if you delete the last step on HotNet, yeah. you get HotNet too. So, 
So you can publish a new algorithm by reversing some of the previous choices. I mean, that's what you see, but, but anyway. No, well, the thing is, you, you, you do it wrong. You do it wrong the first time. And then you go fix your problem. You then you get a new time. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, but that's we didn't do it wrong. It was fine. It was good. I, I don't want to, you know. It was, it, 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 yeah. So the thing is, how would that solve the problem of like the P53s and all that? Right. Why, why did it solve those problems? Ah, yeah. I mean, it's so, you know, it's 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 somewhat subtle, uh, and it's it's maybe kind of even hard to. to well, I don't want to go all the way back in the mathematics, but, um, you know, the the idea is somehow all in how you did this this kind of symmetrizing. So property you and you yeah well and well I mean what you what you really have is and maybe I should go back if I can quickly I mean what you really have is uh, you know th this matrix is not symmetric meaning if I look at you know p53 and one of its neighbors how similar are they so I've got one entry telling me p53 and this neighboring gene are highly similar and the other entry might be telling me that they're not very similar and what happened is they ended up we kind of ended up always picking the highly similar version because it was we were picking the one that was dominated by the highly mutated gene. So P53 was highly similar to all its neighbors because of P53's heat, which is on the one hand true, kind of, you know, P53 is really hot, it has many neighbors, but but the neighbors aren't hot. Yeah, it's like so that's where this kind of idea of we have to look at the neighbor and see does it have any heat and is it sending its heat to P53? And that's kind of what the other entry of the matrix is doing. It's sort of telling you how much of you know, the heat on this other gene is going to P53. Granted, it's a rarely mutated gene, so it doesn't have a lot of heat. But if it's sending it all to P53, then we want to take account of that. So these um, subnetworks that you're finding, are they typically um, pan cancer subnetworks that occur across different tissue types? Or are they more likely to be specific to particular tissues or cancers? It, it, it varies, and that's what the fancy circle diagram was supposed to illustrate. Because um, uh, you know they're arranged according to their enrichment. So we took every single subnetwork after we got it, and we just did, is it enriched in cancer type with just a hypergeometric test? And then we did this sort of thing. So And there's these, all these colors you can't read. but like. Keep one NFE two LE two, for example, is mostly mutated in colorectal and lung adeno, so it ends up down here. Whereas P53 signaling is sort of mutated in many cancer types, and P3 CA is a little bit in breast and endometrial, so you end up over here. Is uh, some of that mutual exclusivity possibly explained by mutations in particular tissue types, or again, is this a pan? -cancer? Yeah, this is this was all pan cancer, and I guess to answer an earlier question, we didn't weight this at all. In fact, so there's you know it's it's not, not somehow weighted by the number of mutations per sample. I think this was your earlier question that I didn't answer. Sorry, the number of samples of each cancer type. So there's a lot more breast cancer here than there was uh, bladder cancer, for example. And we didn't actually reweight for that, so it's. There's many things you can do in the analysis, but this is just throwing everything together. Um, and sorry, your question was, oh, about the mutual exclusivity. Yeah, that's a whole other that's that's a whole other talk. And you can watch Max's talk from February, or I could tell you later about yes, you get mutual exclusivity due to cancer type, and you have to sort of account for that. Here, for the network analysis, we're not. There's no mutual exclusivity. We're not asking for it. We don't care if it's there. We're not looking for it. Whatever, right? <laughs> If you started out with individual cancer data, M mostly it's more samples. So if you it, detect these individual samples, individual yeah. cancers, and then, and then you know, yeah, put but together, do you lose something or? Yes, you would not get a lot of the rare stuff. So it's very hard to find these cohesin condensin things if you do one cancer type at a time because. If you look at the top, cohesin is mutated in total in 5% of these samples. But if you look at those colors, you know, each one's a different cancer type, it's really rare in each cancer type. So if I just did one color, if I made one cancer type there, it'd be really hard to see the signal. All right, let's thank Ben. Ask him any other questions if you want. Thanks.